My name is Gerald Cunningham. I'm a prosthetist, orthotist working in Wells, Maine. Uh, we, about 12 years ago, I developed a brace for treating club foot. Uh, we've had a lot of interest in the brace lately and there's been a lot of questions about it, so we wanted to put together a, a quick introductory video that talks about the design of the brace, the principles behind it. Um, in a bit, we're going to be getting together with one of our patients and we'll get a chance to see the brace on the baby, but uh, this is first just a look at the brace itself. Um, the brace design is fundamentally different than the traditional approach of the boots and bar. Instead of holding the feet statically and attaching them to a bar, the idea behind this is each foot is treated separately. So if it's a unilateral club foot, only one brace is required. The other, the other foot is allowed to remain uh, free. But the brace is based on the notion that the foot can move in any direction that it would like. But when it's not moving actively by the baby, there are forces created by the brace that dynamically and gently stretch the foot into the corrected position. And that's a combination of things. It's a, it's a matter of externally rotating the foot, uh, dorsiflexing the ankle, abducting the forefoot. Uh, and that combination of forces is all included in the brace. It's done by uh, engaging the thigh above the knee with one strap and holding the foot gently with an elastic strap down below. There's a spiral of plastic between the two braces that allows the foot to move in any direction it wants. There's the possibility of dorsiflexion, internal external rotation, um, basically, basically anything that the child wants to do they can do freely. They can roll over, crawl, stand up, they can even walk with this brace. There's articulation to the knee joint as well. So there's the potential for any kind of movement, but if you look down the main axis of the brace you can see that the relative to the line of the thigh the foot is externally rotated about 45 degrees. So if the child is tight it may start here but whenever they're not actively doing something, the brace is stretching them to the outside. And that's done with this gentle spring that's constantly working to externally rotate them. So there's the potential to move anywhere, but the force is always present. The other thing we do is we take this spring and we extend the spring. So effectively, we make the brace deliberately a bit short relative to the location of the thigh. So that the spring has to be distracted vertically and attached to the thigh. What that means is that the foot plate is always being lifted up against the bottom of the foot so that as the baby moves the foot, the foot plate follows that. So there's less need to strap the baby in rigidly. This is a, the strap we use here is just an elastic piece of uh, Velcro that's got give to it. It's very gentle and it's really only there to hold the foot against the medial side of the foot plate where there's a padding at the heel and, and at the forefoot. There's a spring steel across the bottom of the foot that allows this dorsiflexion force to happen. Um, but again, whenever the baby isn't actively stretching, the foot is being lifted into the dorsiflexed position. The padding is used to take up volume in the brace. And as the baby grows, we remove padding, one, one pad at a time, that makes more room for the baby, but also early on, the padding protects the areas that are going to be in contact with the brace and, and uh, allows the baby to get a little bit used to it. But the nice thing is that because we're only attaching the foot to the thigh, the size of the spiral connecting the two is deliberately much bigger than the baby's leg. You'll see when we put this on a baby that there's actually a lot of room there. What that means is that as the baby grows and volume increases this way, the brace continues to fit. When the baby grows skeletally and the tibia starts to lengthen, what we do is we disconnect these two attachment points and there's a separate piece for the thigh that's allowed to slip relative to the piece that becomes the spiral, and it can be simply reattached in half-inch increments so that we can continue to lengthen the brace for tibial growth. What that means is that the brace continues to fit with these little minor adjustments along the way. It continues to fit throughout the course of, typically for boys, uh, four to five months, and for girls, six to eight months uh, of growth. At that point, a second brace is usually fabricated. The treatment only requires bracing to the age of about two. We do full-time bracing at night, or excuse me, full-time bracing during the day and night when they're young, but when they're ready to start walking, it becomes nighttime bracing only. Um, but we find that by the time the baby's around two years old and, and they've grown out of that second brace, the um, uh, they're, they're essentially done treatment. There's been very low incident of relapse with people who are using the brace uh, consistently. Um, the idea behind the brace now is it's being used in this country as a custom brace, and each one is fabricated for each patient. But one of the things that I've been working on over the past um, probably four or five years now is developing a modular version of this brace. Uh, in this country, there is a protocol that works. People are very comfortable with the Ponsetti method, um, the boots and bar. The orthopedists are very uh, 
uh, used to that treatment and, and find it reasonably successful. So there's, there's not much interest in trying something new, but the thought always has been with this brace that the real strength to this is in third world settings where there are underserved populations that don't have access to that kind of regular orthopedic care. So the goal behind developing a modular brace would be to create two sizes that can fit children with minor adjustments from post-casting all the way through to two years of age. So the idea in a third world country we have the option of using the brace over and over again by simply replacing pads and straps, but the plastic itself can be redone. Um, this brace was never patented. I made, a, made the conscious decision not to do that so that it could remain in the public domain. And we're actually working with various organizations to get this out so that it can be used uh, essentially by anyone. Uh, this past spring, um, my daughter and I traveled to Kenya and we started a small trial on six babies uh, with one of the hospitals that works with an organization called Cure International. We were able to uh, get successful enough results that they've expanded that trial to include 60 babies at this point. Um, we're working with a group of biomedical engineering students at Messiah College in, in uh, Pennsylvania uh, on point of use fabrication. We're hoping to develop 3D printing for this. Uh, and, and in the near future, we anticipate that the uh, design for this will be available online so that anybody can, can reach out and download and print this brace. Um, we, at this point, are, what we do is we bring the molds that we use, these are all vacuum formed at this point, handmade. We bring the molds and, and teach the orthotists how to make the braces themselves. Um, but it's out there in the public domain. We want it to be used by anyone who, who's uh, able to use it. We're very excited about the notion that this might help eventually replace the boots and bar in some areas. Uh, because it has the advantage that it's very inexpensive, it's very lightweight, we're not connecting the two feet together, and it's a dynamic brace. Instead of statically positioning, there's that constant stretching, which seems to dramatically reduce treatment times. So that's the brace in short. Um, we'll take a look at it on a baby next, and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you.